Hi, I'm Phil Albertelli, and this is the Week in Doubt, a podcast for atheists, agnostics, and whoever, and this is episode 219. Before we start, I'd like to thank John, is it Belitho or Belitha? Uh, I apologize from the bottom of my heart if I'm butchering your name. Uh, I'm almost certain I am. And uh, Jason Henry for liking the Week in Doubt Facebook page. Thanks, guys. Much appreciated. And I'd also like to give a very special shout out to Nathan and Jennifer Brown for making a very generous and unexpected donation to the show. Out of a sense of discretion or respect for their privacy, I won't mention the exact dollar amount, but it was greatly appreciated, and as I told Nathan, I was having kind of a bad day, and then all of a sudden I get this PayPal notification, and I had to do a double take. It definitely brightened my day, and not just because of the money, but also because of what it represents, that someone cares enough about the show and what I do that they wanted to do something to show their support. And the same goes for you Patreon supporters. Your monthly payments are a reminder that there's people out there who believe in what I'm doing to the point where they're willing to support the show financially. And I know that people work hard for their money and you could be spending it on other things. So in a way, it's humbling. And believe me, I don't take it for granted. And it's very much appreciated. And for those of you who maybe can't afford to support the show monetarily, or you're just not in the habit of supporting content creators, I still appreciate your correspondence and your camaraderie, taking time to get in touch with me via the Facebook page, etc. All of the support, be it financial or otherwise, even those of you who have simply subscribed to the show or who download the episodes, who maybe give me a thumbs up on YouTube, or follow me on Twitter, or like my friend Russ Ray, who take time to share something that I post to the Weekend Out Facebook page. That's all greatly appreciated, and all that stuff also helps to spread the word about the podcast. All right, but enough of that mushy stuff. On with the show. So this week, I'm going to take a look at the late Ian Stevenson and his research into the quote-unquote phenomenon of reincarnation. I got the idea to cover this topic while working on that recent Graham Hancock episode. If you recall, in one of the clips I played, Hancock briefly mentioned Stevenson and his reincarnation research. And to be honest, reincarnation is one of those topics that I've wanted to tackle on the show for a while now. I think the temptation, somewhat justifiably, is to just want to quickly dismiss this sort of thing as superstitious nonsense. But I think as non-believers, as rational free thinkers, what separates us, hopefully, from believers or the religious is our devotion to intellectual honesty and following the facts or evidence wherever it may lead. So even though I'm admittedly skeptical, I figured instead of just glibly writing reincarnation off as nonsense, why not actually take a look at Stevenson's work, give it a fair shake, and see if it actually has any merit or not. And before I really dig in, I just wanted to quickly mention that being a fan of the so-called Four Horsemen, I can't think about reincarnation without thinking of Sam Harris. So I thought, just for the fun of it at least, I'd play a quick clip from an old Beyond Belief conference that features a back and forth between Sam Harris and Lawrence Krauss on the topic of reincarnation. So here we go. The basic point that you make very cogently is that we have this unusual and un totally non-rational acceptance of religious sensibility, especially when those sensibilities are are ludicrous. Mm. And 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 the, the the easy example is is in, in this case maybe Islam as a, or you, you can pick whatever or the Old Testament. But you're much more um, tolerant in your statement. Of course, of Buddhism. You talked about the, the Buddhists who 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 had this compassion, but compassion was based on nonsense. It's based on reincarnation. Well, it's, but, it's but, actually but, I, mean, I can unpack that. But yeah, but, yeah. but okay. But the point is, it's clear to me that you're much more willing to, in some sense, be um, respectful of a nonsensical religious belief which, is, which leads to a positive result, perhaps. So that, so that by going out and immediately attacking the notion that believing things without any evidence is empirically bad, or, or is, is, just, is, just, is just not acceptable, uh, that we are stepping beyond our role as, as, as scientists and 
and inevitably it becomes emotional. You, you don't mind, you wouldn't preach as much against Buddhism as you would against Islam because you don't like, you like, like Islam less than you like Buddhism. And no, so, you're right. Well, so anyway, those are the things I, want, I wanted to provoke both of you, but I think sort of it's a way to bridge between the two of you. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I, uh, good question. Uh, it's not that I'm pulling any punches uh, uh, from Buddhism based on some kind of dogmatic affinity with Buddhists or, or having been raised Buddhist. I mean, this is not uh, what's going on. I happen to think that within Buddhism there's an extraordinarily nuanced and interesting methodology for meditation and there's some very sophisticated uh, discussion of the nature of consciousness, the possibilities of transforming our, our moment to moment perception of the world that, that link up r rather nicely with what we understand about neuroplasticity and, and the human brain at this moment. Um, if you sit in a room with the Dalai Lama talking to physicists and neuroscientists, you'll see that there is a, uh, for the most part, a very open and unconstrained dialogue going on. But the basic and premise is nonsense, right? Reincarnation. Well, well, reincarnation, who knows? I, may, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I have no, well, no, who knows in the sense that there's no, I mean, there are these spooky stories where, you know, a kid, no, I, 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 I am not, okay. Okay. Well, the, the, you, you, re, re, reincarnation, uh, that you are on firm ground being skeptical of reincarnation. Let me say that, okay? Um, I mean, this is, this is going to take us far afield. I, I have published a few spooky things about telepathy and reincarnation, which amount to not an endorsement of, of these beliefs, but just, you know, I hear there's all this data. Someone, someone like Dean Radin writes a book about it. Brian Josephson, a Nobel laureate in physics, blurbs it. I don't have the time to do the meta-analyses or the statistical expertise, so... So let's, I'm, I'm awaiting the evidence. So Sam Harris, perhaps a little bit more open to the paranormal than you uh, may have imagined. Uh, Sam mentions Dean Radin there. And in fairness, I don't know enough about Radin to comment about him at length. He's the senior scientist at the Institute of Noetic Sciences, which is basically an institute dedicated to the study of parapsychology, etc., his first book was The Conscious Universe, The Scientific Truth of Psychic Phenomena. As you might imagine, he's not without his detractors. And his aforementioned first book was criticized for supposed statistical errors, confirmation bias, ignoring plausible natural explanations, and so on. But anyway, enough about that. Let's turn our focus back to Ian Stevenson. So Ian Stevenson was a psychiatrist and researcher known for his work regarding the study of reincarnation and near-death experiences. He was born in Montreal, Canada on October 31st. How spookily appropriate. In 1918, um, and then he passed away in 2007 in Charlottesville, Virginia, at the ripe old age of 88. He had worked at the University of Virginia School of Medicine for 50 years, holding various titles throughout his time there, including chair of the Department of Psychiatry, Carlson Professor of Psychiatry, and Research Professor of Psychiatry. Interestingly enough, if we delve back into his childhood, his mother was supposedly interested in theosophy and had a vast collection of books on the subject. Stevenson himself has said that he thought that's where his initial interest in the paranormal came from. If you're not familiar, theosophy, or at least the organization known as the Theosophical Society specifically, was founded in the late 19th century in New York City. One of the founders was a rather colorful figure known as Madame Blavatsky, she was rather controversial and polarizing, to some a holy guru, to others simply a charlatan. Their three stated objectives were actually rather positive. Uh, number one is to form a nucleus of the universal brotherhood of humanity without distinction of race, creed, sex, caste, or color. So that's pretty good. Uh, two, to encourage the study of comparative religion, philosophy, and science. Also uh, pretty awesome. And then three, to investigate the unexplained laws of nature and the powers latent in man. So the last one gets a little airy-fairy, but investigating the unexplained laws of nature sounds pretty good, depending on how you interpret that. If you're talking about using the scientific method to try to understand the laws of nature and the cosmos, then all right. But my guess is when they say unexplained, they're referring to the paranormal. Theosophy embraced a belief in these beings known as ascended masters, who supposedly possess supernatural abilities such as astral projection and clairvoyance, etc. So uh, it gets pretty wacky. 
But yeah, to uh, reiterate, it seems his interest in the paranormal stemmed from his mother's interest in theosophy. So Stevenson had conventional training in medicine, but supposedly he eventually became disillusioned with the quote-unquote reductionism of biology and started to focus more on things like psychosomatic illness and looking at the patient as a whole rather than the sum of their parts, or something to that effect. He was fascinated by the question of why one person would get one kind of illness while another person would get another, and thought that neither heredity nor environment could provide a satisfactory answer to the question of why certain people have certain inherent fears, talents, and quote-unquote special abilities. So he posited that a third possible explanation might be personality or memory transfer. This already seems like a pretty big leap to me. As a skeptical layman, I don't see why genetic diversity couldn't, for the most part, explain things like why some people are more susceptible to certain illnesses, etc. And the same probably goes for why some people are more inclined to have certain fears or are seemingly quote-unquote gifted. Am I using quote-unquote too much? Um, you know, gifted with certain talents. Some people might have a certain type of wiring, so to speak, that makes them more likely to be good artists. Some people might have a brain chemistry that makes them naturally more anxious or fearful of things like barking dogs, etc. I don't think we have to jump to the conclusion that the person must have been bitten by a schnauzer in a past life. But I have to tell you, I did learn one thing about Ian Stevenson that kind of won me over. Supposedly, he met Aldous Huxley back in the 1950s and tried LSD, and he was so affected by his LSD experience that he said something to the effect that he didn't think he could ever be angry again. So pretty cool. Uh, but onward, so in the late 1950s, Stevenson wrote several articles for Harper's focusing on paranormal topics such as psychosomatic illness and extrasensory perception. In 1958, his essay entitled The Evidence for Survival from Claimed Memories of Former Incarnations was the winning submission in a contest for best essay on, here we go again, quote unquote, paranormal mental phenomena and their relationship to the problem of survival of the human personality after bodily death. And the contest was held by the American Society for Psychical Research, and it was in honor of American philosopher and psychologist William James. Stevenson's submission looked at 44 cases of people, mostly children, who claimed to have remembered past lives. It caught the attention of a woman by the name of Eileen Garrett, the founder of the Parapsychology Foundation. Garrett gave Stevenson a grant to travel to India for the purpose of interviewing a boy who was thought to be reincarnated. Supposedly, Stevenson discovered 25 other cases while in India over a period of four weeks. This provided him with enough material to write his first book, 20 Cases Suggestive of Reincarnation. Chester Carlson, the inventor of xerography, provided Stevenson with further financial aid. This allowed him to step down as the chair of the psychiatry department at the University of Virginia and set up his own division within the department, which Stevenson dubbed the Division of Personality Studies, later renamed the Division of Perceptual Studies. When Carlson passed away in 1968, he bequeathed a million dollars to the university with the intent that it be used to further Stevenson's work. Despite the controversial nature of Stevenson's research, the donation was accepted, and he was the first to be named Carlson Professor of Psychiatry, a title owing its name to his late benefactor, Chester Carlson. The bequest left by Carlson allowed Ian Stevenson to travel around the world from Africa to Alaska, collecting approximately 3,000 case studies. Most of those he interviewed were children. According to Stevenson, 61% claimed that their previous life had ended violently. The remainder supposedly claimed to have died in childhood, sometimes suddenly after a brief illness with a sense of quote-unquote, there we go again, unfinished business. Late professor of psychiatry Remy Cotteret, or Cotteret, perhaps, wrote in the American Journal of Psychiatry that the typical age that the children started to discuss past life memories was somewhere between two to four years, and that by eight they had usually ceased speaking about it. 
And I think, as I mentioned earlier, according to Stevenson, supposedly the children often seem to have inherited certain fears or abilities from their past lives. And once again, supposedly, would sometimes even have birthmarks or birth defects that corresponded with injuries on the bodies of their previous incarnations. This was a recurring theme in Stevenson's work. And in fact, one of his books was actually entitled Reincarnation and Biology, a contribution to the etiology of birthmarks and birth defects. I believe that one was published in 1997, and a kind of dumbed-down version was released for public consumption, bearing the alternate title, Where Reincarnation and Biology Intersect. The book takes a look at 200 cases of children who supposedly, supposedly drinking game word of the week, along with uh, quote-unquote, well actually quote-unquote's a phrase, uh, had birth defects or birthmarks that corresponded with injuries on the bodies of the people they claimed to have been in a former life. Some of the examples include children with missing or malformed fingers who claim to have lost fingers in their past life, a boy with marks resembling entrance and exit wounds who claimed remembering being shot, and a girl with a scar around her head who claimed to remember the life of someone who underwent skull surgery. They call it a scar. My question would be, if it was a scar and not a birthmark, how did she acquire the scar in her present life? And if she acquired it uh, due to injury, can it really be said to be inherited from a past life? In fairness to Stevenson, he was supposedly, supposedly, honest enough to admit that he couldn't provide an explanation as to how personality traits, etc. might survive death and be carried over from one body to another. And although he obviously supported the idea of reincarnation, he never fully claimed that he knew for sure that it actually occurs, but nevertheless asserted that he thought reincarnation, as I think I mentioned earlier, in his opinion, provided a third possibility for certain phenomena phenomena, personality traits, etc., that according to him, couldn't be explained by heredity or environment. Here's a quote from the man himself. Reincarnation is the best, even though not the only, explanation for the stronger cases we have investigated. I'm not sure I would agree with that. Uh, once again, his words, not mine. But speaking of his case studies, I think I'll now move on to a couple of examples. So first, there's the case of Corliss Chotkin. And this is a case that was highlighted by one of Stevenson's chief critics, a philosopher by the name of Paul Edwards. The Chotkins were members of the Alaskan uh, Klingit people. Klingit. Klingit. I think that's it. Or is it Klingit? Uh, <laughs> I'm an old Northern Exposure fan, and they were always talking about the Klingit people, the Klingit people on Northern Exposure. But anyway, the Klingit are said to have a strong belief in reincarnation. And that brings up another reoccurring criticism of Stevens' work. Multiple critics have complained that Stevenson tended to draw most of his case studies from cultures that have a deep-rooted belief in reincarnation, like that of the indigenous Klingit people of Alaska or of Hindu India. The problem being that it's hard to get objective testimony when your subject and the people you're interviewing have already been primed to believe in reincarnation. In response to this accusation, Stevenson actually did some European case studies and published a book in 2003 entitled European Cases of the Reincarnation Type, which for some reason strikes me as kind of a strange or awkward title. But back to the case of Corliss Chalkin. So Stevenson's critic, Paul Edwards, said that the case rested entirely on the testimony of one woman, the niece of a fisherman by the name of Victor Vincent. Victor supposedly, uh, supposedly take a drink, told his niece that he would be reborn as her son and said, I hope I don't stutter then as much as I do now. Your son will have these scars. He proceeded to show her two surgical scars on his body one on the bridge of his nose and another on his back surrounded by smaller stitch marks. Victor Vincent died in 1948, and supposedly, 18 months later, his niece gave birth to Corliss. And once again, supposedly, as long as you're not driving, throw another one back, supposedly Corliss bore birthmarks in the same place as Vincent's scars, including smaller marks surrounding the one on his back, presumably corresponding to Vincent's stitches. Ian Stevenson didn't become aware of the story of Corliss Chalkin until 14 years later. He interviewed the family multiple times between 1962 and 72. Supposedly, have a drink, like Vincent, Corliss had a stutter, was left-handed, liked boats, and was religious. 
If true, the stutter and the left-handed thing might be a little eyebrow-raising, but liking boats, he's a native Alaskan, I'm sure fishing, etc., is probably a significant part of their culture, and being religious, lots of people are religious, According to the niece, Corliss, while still a small child, had recognized members of Victor's family and called them by name, saying things like, There is William, my son. There's my Susie. And of the wife, there's Rose. Edwards pointed out what he saw as some of the weaknesses of the case, including the family's belief in reincarnation, the fact that Stevenson had never seen Corliss as scars, and that all of the major details of the case relied solely on the niece's testimony. Stevenson himself had admitted that several people had told him that she had a tendency to embellish or invent stories. In the opinion of Edwards, similar weaknesses could be found in all of Stevenson's cases. So next we'll take a look at one of Stevenson's European cases, specifically the case of Edward Ryle, an English boy who claimed to be the reincarnation of a man born in Taunton, England in 1645 by the name of John Fletcher. Ryle would eventually author a book entitled Second Time Around, with an introduction written by Stevenson himself. Stevenson had investigated the case and claimed that certain details of Ryle's supposed past life memories had proven accurate, including the name of the vicar of the local church, as well as the names of certain landowning families of the time. Stevenson thought the case to be genuine and declared, I think it most probable that he has memories of a real previous life and that he is indeed John Fletcher reborn, as he believes himself to be. British physicist John Taylor investigated the case. He visited the local church and with the reverend's permission poured over all the available church records. He could find no mention of a John Fletcher in the birth, death, or marriage records dating between 1645 and 1685. He concluded that the John Fletcher associated with the Edward Ryle case had never existed. And furthermore, he posited that Ryle could have gained his knowledge of the period from a church booklet published in 1920 which contained 17th century church records. Stevenson's aforementioned critic, Paul Edwards, wrote, Ryle was eventually exposed as either a hoaxer or the victim of delusions, or very possibly a combination of the two. Stevenson himself, in his book European Cases of the Reincarnation Type, wrote, I can no longer believe that all of Edward Ryle's apparent memories derive from a previous life, because some of his details are clearly wrong. And yet he still insisted that some of Ryle's knowledge of the 17th century must have been acquired by paranormal means. Edwards, Indian philosopher C.T.K. Chari, and other critics have pointed out possible flaws in Stevenson's methodology, such as that the children or their parents may have been deceiving him. His use of translators who may have believed in the reincarnation claims of the person being interviewed, a seeming tendency on Stevenson's part to ask leading questions, results that seem tainted by confirmation bias, and the fact that Stevenson apparently had a habit of not including cases that didn't support his reincarnation hypothesis. Others have also argued that by simply applying Occam's razor to Stevenson's cases, one could rather easily find more mundane or prosaic explanations other than that the children must have been reincarnated. A philosopher of religion aptly named Leonard Angel said to the New York Times that Stevenson used quote-unquote, mm -hmm, improper standards, and went on to say, but you do have to look carefully to see it. That's why he's been very persuasive to many people. A science writer named Terence Hines wrote, the major problem with Stevenson's work is that the methods he used to investigate alleged cases of reincarnation are inadequate to rule out simple imaginative storytelling on the part of the children claiming to be reincarnations of dead individuals. In the seemingly most impressive cases, as Stevenson has reported, the children claiming to be reincarnated knew friends and relatives of the dead individual. The children's knowledge of facts about these individuals is then somewhat less than conclusive evidence for reincarnation. Okay, so that's the end of that quote. Um, now, there was an Indian investigator named Satwant Pasricha, I think, who worked with Stevenson. Uh, and a man named David Barker, who had investigated about 59 cases with her, commented that he could not find a single case in which there was convincing evidence of the presence of paranormal process. Stevenson had also come under fire from certain linguists. 
Commenting on a case in which Stevenson claimed a woman known by the initials T.E. was able to speak Swedish, which she had uh, supposedly uh, learned in a past life, linguist Sarah Thompson said, Stevenson is unsophisticated about language, saying that T.E. Swedish was unconvincing and the linguistic evidence is too weak to provide support for the claims of xenoglossy. Basically a fancy word for speaking a foreign language that should be unknown to the speaker. I think I touched on the topic of xenoglossy not too long ago while discussing demonic possession. A psychologist by the name of David Lester shared a similar sentiment, noting that subjects often mispronounced words, made grammatical errors, and demonstrated a very limited vocabulary in the languages they had claimed to have learned in a previous life. A professor named William Frawley pointed to a case in which a female subject suspiciously could only answer yes or no in German, and another in which the subject was said to be able to speak Bengali, albeit with a poor pronunciation. Frawley noted that she had grown up speaking Marathi, or Marathi, a related dialect, and that she had studied the root language of both dialects, Sanskrit, and lived in a town with thousands of Bengalis. The New York Times in Stevenson's obituary described him as follows in regard to how he was seen by detractors and his more skeptical peers. Earnest, dogged, but ultimately misguided, led astray by gullibility, wishful thinking, and a tendency to see science where others saw superstition. So as you might imagine, I'm not really too convinced that Stevenson had found any genuine cases of reincarnation. But in fairness, and I'm trying my best to be intellectually honest here, Stevenson authored 14 books and roughly 300 papers on the subject of reincarnation and compiled literally thousands of case studies of which I've only provided a handful of examples. So that should definitely be taken into consideration. And he did have his supporters. There have been a few books published that are supportive of his work, namely a book entitled Somewhat Cornerly, Old Souls by Washington Post journalist Tom Schroeder, Life Before Life by a psychiatrist named Jim B. Tucker, a colleague of Stevenson's at the University of Virginia, and Science, the Self, and Survival After Death by Emily Williams Kelly, Ph.D., who I believe works or is affiliated with the University of Virginia Division of Perceptual Studies, which, as I mentioned earlier, was founded by Stevenson. So once again, I'm not convinced, but does the fact that Stevenson's work may have ultimately been flawed or unconvincing mean that reincarnation doesn't exist? Technically, no, it doesn't. Although as an agnostic atheist, I'm rather skeptical, to put it mildly, but if you're interested in the subject, I encourage you to keep researching for yourself and come to your own conclusion, maybe even read some of Stevenson's books. And just a quick personal thought on the subject of reincarnation, and this occurred to me during the week while researching this episode, I think obviously one of the things people like about the idea, and this goes for the concept of an afterlife in general, is that it offers a sense of comfort or consolation. It allows you to believe that physical death isn't the end. And even I used to find the idea of reincarnation appealing. But when I thought about it this week, ironically, I found the notion to be somewhat depressing. Sure, the idea of surviving death and getting another chance on the merry-go-round sounds pretty cool. But when I really thought about it, the idea of being born all over again into a family of strangers, having little or no knowledge of your previous life, all your intimate and treasured relationships, old friends and family wiped away... It left me with a kind of melancholy feeling. And if you start over, relatively speaking, with a blank slate, with no knowledge of your former self, is it really even you anymore? Uh, I can imagine what believers in reincarnation would probably say in response. Oh, it's some kind of cosmic life lesson or learning experience. I don't know. It's, it's funny how in Buddhism the goal is to not be reincarnated anymore, to attain nirvana and escape samsara, that endless spinning wheel of life and death with all its suffering. But anyway, on that cherry note, you guys know the drill. Please like the Facebook page. You can follow the show on Twitter. Please check out the YouTube channel. You can subscribe to the show via iTunes or uh, Podbean. You can also find the archives going all the way back to the inaugural episode on Podbean. And if you want to support the show monetarily, you can use the PayPal widget at the bottom of the Podbean page. There's all that famous alliteration. Or you can go to patreon.com slash the weekend out and support the show for as little as 99 cents a month. All right, why don't I leave you with a little reincarnation music? <laughs>